May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O oh God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Great to see you. Great to see you. We have been receiving email and messages and greetings from All Saints members and friends from around the country and in fact the world today. And the following one was particularly memorable from a member of All Saints Church who is in India for business. Last Christmas Eve, she was here in these pews with her father who died this past year. And although it is Christmas morning in India, she wrote that last night in India that she was remembering us and remembering Christmas with her dad. She said, tonight, I went with a few friends to a Hindu temple across the street from our apartment where they were singing Christmas carols for the birth of Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Apparently to the Hindus, Jesus is a Lord, a manifestation of the one God. She continues, I was fascinated to learn about that. And then they started the evening with Silent Night, at which point I promptly started crying, remembering my father. They followed that with The Little Drummer Boy. <laughs> More crying, as that one reminds me of him, too. I finally pulled myself together by the time that the Hindus got around to singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> and jingle bells. <laughs> the caroling at the temple was sweet and it gave me peace as I remembered my father and being next to him at All Saints last year. Their caroling was very much appreciated on Christmas Eve here in India tonight. Merry Christmas. My friends, we've come together to celebrate the birth of Jesus which according to the proclamation of the angels in the Christmas story, that proclamation took place as good news for all people, a radically inclusive message. One of our Muslim guests tonight, whom I will welcome by name in a moment, emailed and signed it, a Jesus lover. <laughs> there is something compelling and unifying about Jesus if Jesus is understood as a peacemaking, justice-promoting, compassionate one rooted in love. A universal understanding of Jesus, actually, prior to that point in history when the Roman Emperor Constantine perverted Christianity and turned the cross of Jesus' forgiveness and nonviolence into an anti-Semitic sword of domination and division. So it is especially appropriate each year for us here at All Saints to welcome a large number of interfaith guests and friends. There are more of you here than I can name, but I do want to welcome certain guests. Our rabbi in residence who has, is always here, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, has to be in New York City tonight with his wife, Joan, their son is uh, on a vacation from Moscow, and he couldn't be here, sent his love and greetings. But his two daughters, two of his daughters, Eve Bierman and Elizabeth Rothbart, are here with Elizabeth's family. My sole friend, Joshua Levine Grader, senior rabbi and spiritual leader of the Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center, is here. Jane El Farah, one of the Muslim leaders of our interfaith study group here at All Saints, is here. Dr. Nazir Kaja, international leader for peace and justice, poet, gastroenterologist also. <laughs> Rabbi Heather Miller, the rabbinic fellow at Congregation Beth Chaim Hasidim in Los Angeles is here. Miriam Mahudin, the communications coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. 
Shaquille Saeed, who is the executive director of the Shura Council of Southern California, AKA lover of Jesus is here. <laughs> and Annie Zanafeld, the president of Muslims for Progressive Values. We welcome all of you, our friends, and so many more. Thank you, Rabbi Miller, for reading that lesson so beautifully in Hebrew. My colleague, Christina Hanchel, wrote an evocative reflection for our December newsletter. She spoke of the benefit of repeating the seasons of the church's liturgical calendar as an opportunity to rework one's theology, one's understanding about, of religion about, in this case, the preparatory season of Advent leading up to tonight's celebration of Christmas. To be sure, I have been in a major rethinking of my own faith and what Christmas means this year. My redoing or revisiting certain elements of the faith received a deep shift this past summer when upon the occasion of the visit of our daughter and her family, upon the advice of another colleague, Juliana Serrano, we took our ch grandchildren to visit the Space Shuttle Endeavor at the California Science Center, and then watched the IMAX 3D movie about the Hubble Space Telescope. The advertisement for that movie said that it would change the way you view the universe and yourself, and it did. I've always known something about how vast the universe is. After all, we use here at All Saints a prayer for consecra consecrating the bread and wine that all of us tonight will say in a few minutes. That prayer speaks of the vast expanse of interstellar space, the galaxies, the suns, and this fragile earth, our island home. But I hadn't had an experiential appreciation for that until I was sitting in the theater with my wife, daughter, son-in-law, our now 10-year-old granddaughter, and on my lap, our five-year-old grandson. We were all wearing 3D glasses, and the camera zoomed out of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and into other galaxies as the voice spoke of the Hubble telescope and other instruments telling us that there are at least 100 billion galaxies and at least 100 billion stars per average galaxy. And as we went on that cinematic voyage into other galaxies and other stars, and those stars came out toward us in three dimensions, our grandson Luke reached out to catch the stars as they <laughs> came by us. Then the camera reversed course, back up, backed up, took a wide scope view of the entire universe. And it seemed to my imagination that those 100 billion galaxies with all those stars were truly an interstellar web of mystery, beauty, and life. And soon after that experience, I attended a funeral in which the preacher used some images to, des to describe heaven that have been repeated so frequently that they seemed to have no power for me anymore. I later read the poet John O'Donohue summarizing actually my feelings. O'Donohue wrote, I think that one of the reasons that so many people turn away from religion in our times is that the God question has died before them because the question has been framed in such repetitive dead language. And I was talking all this over with a particular friend who is on his own spiritual path of reworking some old religious categories. And he said out of the blue, would you and your wife be interested in going to India with me? I want to go there on a spiritual quest. I immediately said, yes. 
India has always been on my bucket list, and I had given it up. And then I said, what if we tried to have a private audience with the Dalai Lama? And he grinned skeptically. And I took his grin as a challenge. <laughs> so I wrote our friend Archbishop Desmond Tutu and asked him if he could possibly set up an audience. And he said he would try. His effort succeeded. And last month, our friend Robert Winter, my wife Hope, and I found ourselves in Dharamsala at His Holiness's residence in a private audience. Now, with apologies to my colleagues on staff who have heard this ad nauseum. <laughs> and all are rolling their eyes in their soul. Oh, not another story about the Dalai Lama. I will proceed to tell you all what I want to share with you. I'll make a detailed and longer report about the trip on Sunday, January 5, in our Rector's Forum, to which I invite you all. Oprah Winfrey taught me that that's called a teaser. But suffice it to say that His Holiness continued to shift my way of thinking about God and life and meditation and religion and Jesus and Christianity and all of the globe's religions. Now, before I tell you where I am tonight with Jesus, with this star over the stable in Bethlehem, the shepherds and the wise men, let me offer a frame of reference. We have had a large number of memorial services and funerals leading up to tonight's celebration here at All Saints. Last Saturday, we thanked God for and celebrated the life of Penny Cariff, who as a nurse first in Huntington Hospital's neonatal department and later an oncology nurse and then an AIDS nurse, Penny was always an amazing instrument of healing who insisted on living life to the fullest and to the most expansive edges possible. And Penny found God and healing everywhere, here in the Eucharist, as well as in yoga and Buddhist meditation and Dharma talks and Native American rituals and, and, and. Then at age 57, she expanded her medical knowledge and received a certificate in Chinese medicine. So when another parishioner, Jane Olson, offered a reflection on Penny's life at Penny's memorial service last Saturday, she told the story. Jane and Penny, the deceased, had decided to have bunions on their feet surgically removed. The bunions had grown because, as Jane said, in their youth, these two women had been expected to wear shoes that were too tight, with heels too high, and with show toes, sh shoe to toes, that's hard to say, shoe toes too narrow. Jane's surgery was more extensive and her convalescence more complicated. And her friend Penny would drop by Jane's after work daily to administer both Western and Eastern medical treatments. After Jane had fully recovered, Penny gave Jane a paperweight for her desk which she has on her desk to this day. The paperweight reads, there are no bad people, just tight shoes. <laughs> when Jane told that story, a variation on the theme immediately came to my mind. There are no bad people, just tight shoes? How about there are no bad people, just tight religions. Tight religions. By that I mean fear-based theology, divisive, joyless, oppressive, bigoted religious practices and thinking that promote division and dehumanization. There are no bad people, but there are people who do very bad things in the name of very bad theological understandings of God. A punishing, angry God creates punitive and angry people. A loving, forgiving God creates loving and forgiving people. A petty, vengeful God creates petty, vengeful people. Now back to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So during the course of our being with Him, 
Did I tell you it was a private audience for just three of us? <laughs> oh, maybe I did say that. I thanked him for his global leadership in a project that his friend and my spiritual mentor, Thomas Merton, developed as Merton's passion. And that is the project of each of us going so deeply into the profound meanings of our own religion until we access the fountain of living water that is in every religion that refreshes and cleanses and blesses everyone it touches and makes people new and vibrant and vital. His Holiness said that he believed that that center that is in Buddhism and also in Christianity was the practice of forgiveness and compassion toward every sentient being. What was stunning to me was the joy I felt after 30 or 45 minutes with His Holiness. Now, he calls himself a professional laugher, and he did crack a joke at every turn, at one point keeping us in stitches. He had posed for a photograph holding my wife's and my hands on the sofa sitting between us. And when we all got up, he turned and looked at my stomach and said, how much do you weigh? And then he said, I've just been to my doctor and he told me to reduce. Maybe you should go see your doctor. <laughs> and then when he gave my wife this little bejeweled heart candy box, he gave it to her and pointed to my stomach. He says, don't let him have any. <laughs> so I've come to this um, Christmas in a different place. The one who has many names. The one with a capital O who created this universe. Who I believe became flesh in this humble poor immigrant baby tonight. Is much bigger than a lot of the repetitive dead language that institutional religion has used heretofore. What we need in the world are communities of faith that care more about being a movement of justice and inclusion than being an institution. That choose inspiration over institution. That choose compassion and forgiveness and justice and peace over the status quo. And if we don't do that, we will lapse into bad religion, tight, constrictive, narrow religion, and ideology. And all of those things really do kill. This morning on Christmas Eve morning, Queen Elizabeth II issued a belated pardon to British mathematician Alan Turing, 60 years after he committed suicide. Alan Turing had helped crack Nazi Germany's Enigma code and laid the groundwork for modern computing. But he did not hide that he had the love of his life who was another man. And so he was convicted of a law called gross indecency. In 1952, he was stripped of his security clearance, subjected to monitoring by British authorities, and forced to take estrogen to neutralize his sex drive, a process described by some as chemical castration. And that led him to take his own life by ingesting cyanide. Everyone who is hurting tonight and everyone who is hurting others tonight are laboring under a constricting, suffocating, abusive ideology, theology, 
religion, or philosophy. And that, my friends, brings us to the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christmas. Wherever there is exclusion, despair, oppression, bigotry, injustice, and violence tonight. Whether it is expressed externally toward others or internally toward ourselves, Christmas says in the voice of the angels, do not be afraid. I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. You can have the dark night of the soul where everything is as bleak as a Palestinian hillside. You can be the victim of an oppressive occupation like that of Rome in the Middle East where there is as little political hope as Mary and Joseph experienced in having to travel a long distance to be registered for an economically unjust taxation of the poor. You can experience that there is no room in life either for you, for who you really are, or for you to take care of your own health needs as a woman as Mary experienced when the innkeeper told her that there was no room in the inn for her to have her baby. You can be as poor as the shepherds were that night, the poorest of the poor, since they could not afford to pay the temple tax or to buy an animal to go sacrifice at the temple. They were known as the lowest of the low sinners. You can be someone who cares little about religion or be of another religion or be an atheist or be someone who only trusts the findings of the scientific method like the wise persons, the magi from the east. And despite all of these and other tight shoes or tight places, the light of the star and the songs of the angels sing for you and the world tonight. A mature God creates mature people. A big God creates big people. A constricting God creates constricted people. An angry God creates angry people. Those with a fearful worldview carry within them a fear-oriented God. Make sure that you don't adopt a religion that says just love those who love us. But rather participate in a larger love. A divine love. Participate in something larger than yourself. Desmond Tutu has said, God is not a Christian. Dr. Maher Hatut has said, God does not belong to any religion. All religions belong to God. So as you rework and redo your own religion, your own philosophy of life, if your religious beliefs do not lead you to a life of radically inclusive joy for all people, just consider that your shoes are too tight. <laughs> Michelangelo, the great sculptor, architect, painter, at age 87, said, I am still learning. So friends, come back next year, and we'll see how we're still learning, still reworking, still redoing this Christmas thing in an interfaith context until we have global peace, global justice, global inclusion, the absence of bigotry, and the presence of radically inclusive joy. Amen.